you know, it's been a morning full of crying and laughing and singing, so that means it's a good day. For me, it means it's a good day. You know, for some people, they don't like that, so that's fine. But I love laughing and crying and singing and worshiping God and getting to be here with friends and family. This is awesome, man. I don't want to take that for granted ever. So I'm just thankful. Thank you all for being here this morning. It's good to see you. Uh, and, and everybody who's tuning in online, thank you for joining us today. Um, trying, to, trying to come down off of this worship time. Not come down off of it, but like gather myself so I can say coherent things and uh, not just be a blubbering, blabbing mess. So um, again, thank you. Thank you for being here. Man, I'm just excited about what's God, what God is doing in this place and uh, in our lives. I can, just, I can testify of my own life how God has been just stirring, talking about stirring things up, stirring stuff up in my life. Um, and I'm just thankful for that because I believe that God has good and great things for each and every one of us. And I believe that he wants to use, just like uh, Sister Beverly was sharing, uh, wants to use each and every one of us. We each have things that he's placed inside each one of us uh, for, not just for ourselves, but for others, for the world, for the body of Christ, encouraging. We want to equip, we want to train, we want to encourage so that you get to a place where you are comfortable in that, that you feel confident in that to go and be that, right? And so, so that's, that's, that's my hope, even what we're doing this morning uh, in worship and in teaching, that we are receiving from the Lord. We are becoming more and more confident because our confidence is not in us. Our confidence is in Him. Amen? Okay. So I will tell you this morning, I might need a little bit of help today, all right? Some response. It's, it is okay to verbally confirm and say amen. It's okay to use your voices today. I want to give you permission. You don't have to be super quiet today. Uh, I like, you know, just personally, I like conversation. I, I, I really don't like just talking, just talking, contrary to what some people might think. I, I like having a conversation, and so a little back and forth is always a good thing, and so I just want to give you permission that you can speak today, just like you sang. It's beautiful. I loved it, so... Amen. Well, thank you. Well, as, uh, as Kim had said, we have started a series called Salt Assault, and uh, this is like the third week, or yeah, third week that we've been on this. And so um, I'm just going to quickly, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 is kind of where this all begins, and I don't want to go over everything that we've talked about for the past two weeks, but I want to touch on a couple points because we're going to build on those points as we go forward today. And so um, let's just go ahead and start in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, which is Jesus speaking. And he says, your lives are like salt among the people. But if you, like salt, become bland, how then can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and would be thrown out and trampled on by others. And so the first week we talked about this, and we talked about what Jesus said. And you know, I mentioned that I'm, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, how does salt lose its saltiness? So I began to research and look that up. And one of the things that I found that salt was used for back in Jesus' day was it was actually, it wasn't the pure refined salt that you and I get today. It was more of a blend of the actual like raw minerals and material. And so um, in that, there would be a mixture or a blend. And, and, if, if, and it was used, one of the things that it was used for, the purposes it was used for, was as a catalyst uh, with dried out cow dung to start fires. Very interesting, I know. At least for me it was. I, I, I'm going to tell you something, okay? I, when the Lord gave me this thing about salt to salt, I thought, Lord, how, like, you can only say so much about salt. Right? You can only, and I, at least that's what I thought. I was like, God, is this a sermon series? How are you going to make this a series? Is this a series or just a sermon? Because I feel like I could talk about salt in a, ser- in a, seri- or a sermon, but not a series. And then he reminded me, he said, Caleb, I took five loaves and two fishes and fed thousands. Can I not multiply? I'm like, hey, okay, yes, sir. You know, and so I'm just, it, 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 I told Marley last night, I said, it has just fascinated me. Um, I didn't know, I mean, I, let's be honest. How many of you guys have studied salt in your life? <laughs> right? You probably used it, but like actually studying it. And so as <laughs> George Calico, because I have, I'm just a science teacher over here. <laughs> but, but for the majority of us non-science folks, uh, we probably haven't done too much research and study into science, or I mean into salt. 
And so as I have been, though, I was telling Marley, I was like, this is just really fascinating to me. And this morning, as we continue on, we're going to talk about, um, we talked last week about one of the purposes of salt, which was preservation. And today we're going to talk about another purpose of salt. And as I'm, I'm just studying and reading and learning and learning about salt, I'm like, this is fascinating. And even as I'm reading it, just the parallels between that and, and the spiritual walk and the spiritual life, it's just really, really cool, guys. So I was entertained, and I felt like I received some revelation, pretty cool stuff. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Jesus always, he taught the multitudes in pictures, right? And he did that so that we could understand better. And I think that if we just say, hey, you're like salt, well, we get a picture of what that might be like. But if we begin to break that picture down and look at all the different colors of that picture and the images in that picture, it helps us to understand a little bit more and maybe get some more revelation as to who we are in him. And here's the thing about revelation. Revelation without application is just information. I don't just want to know about who I am. I want to know who I am in him and take and apply that, that application, apply that in my life and in my walk, just like what you were talking about earlier, about applying the gifts of the Spirit. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today, actually. But rewind, let's go back a little bit about what salt is like. We talked about the blend of salt, how it actually did have the ability to lose saltiness because it was a blend. Um, And when that was the case, they would just toss it out because it couldn't be used for what it needed to be used for. Um, And Jesus is, is essentially saying that if you have salt, you have saltiness. If you don't have saltiness, you don't have salt. And salt is like the, the characteristics of salt are like what distinguish us as disciples of Jesus Christ. Our saltiness distinguishes us. If you, if you taste something and it tastes like salt, it's, it's got salt in it. It's salty. It's very distinguishable. And, and Jesus is essentially saying that if you lose what makes you mine, you're like salt that's lost its saltiness. Don't get to that place. Don't be in that place. And so Anyway, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we talked about today uh, what, what more purified, refined salt looks like, the sodium chloride that we have, and about how of a strong of a bond it is. Not if you've heard this sermon before. Okay, there's one. Okay, all right. Uh, and and how, the, how it is very, a very strong bond together, but that there are two ways uh, in which salt today can lose its saltiness, and one was dilution. Do you remember that? Salt can be diluted, and when it's diluted, that's like complacency as a Christian, where I allow other things to come in to my life. I begin to believe other gospels, the gospel of America or the gospel of a different kind of a doctrine, you know, uh, humanism or universalism. I begin to believe these other things that may sound good to my human ears, but in my spirit it rubs and it is wrong, and it begins to dilute the gospel of Jesus Christ. It tries to present itself as a counterfeit and attach itself on, but, but the reality is what is happening is when I begin to partner with those things, I dilute the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I begin to lose the things that distinguish me as a Christian and as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus. And so we have to be on guard, be vigilant against dilution in our own lives. The second thing was, was through uh, electrocution, and I believe the appropriate term is um, electrolysis. Is that correct? Electrolysis is how... Uh, is another way in which salt, could, the salt molecule can be changed. And, uh, and what that is similar to is like a, a skeptic Christian, one who, I understand what the Word of God says, but, you know, hey, it's 2021. Is that really applicable today? You know, I understand that, that we shouldn't really gossip about people, but did you hear about Marley? I heard she's got a baby in her tummy. <laughs> hey, it's true. It's not gossip. It's true. She really does. Do in April. Thank you, Lord. We're going to be outnumbered, guys. Pray for me. All right. Anyway, (laughs) the skeptic Christian, that's like electrolysis. And that's another way in which salt can lose its saltiness is is when we become as Christians, when we we become skeptic Christians or think that we know it all and think that, eh, yeah, the word of God says this, but I'm not going to apply that in my life. I'm going to just take it and do kind of what I want with it. Um, That's where we begin to lose the distinguishability of our discipleship in Jesus Christ. And, and when we get to that place, we're worthless as Christians. When we get to that place, we no longer look like Jesus. And so what we do is we bear his name in vain. We say, this is what Jesus looks like, when in reality, that's not what Jesus looks like. And then we can lead people away from Jesus, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So we have to be vigilant. Jesus is warning and saying, be vigilant against these kinds of things. Watch for this stuff. Make sure this isn't happening because this isn't what my disciples look like. 
And we talked about what do Jesus' disciples look like. And all you got to do is back up a few verses. And he says, blessed are the... And he goes this, through this list of what we call the Beatitudes. And he talks about, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who thunger... Thunger. That's a new word. Thunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. <laughs> Hey, I had a little bit of coffee this morning. I, I, t- I, I told Trent, I promise I'm only going to drink half of the cup today, so I'm not like, you know, too crazy. So bear with me this morning. But he, he, he lays out this, this is what my disciples look like. And then he goes on later on and he says things like, they're going to know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And your love for one another is going to be so great. It's going to look like me. It's, gonna, it's not just the love that, that you think. It's not going to be a love that the world demonstrates. It's the love that I carry and demonstrate. It's the agape love of God, which is his very nature. And so, anyway, I hope that reminds you a little bit. This is kind of the background of the backstory for what we're, what we're talking about a little bit today. This is what salt is like. So then we talked last week about um, purposes of salt. See, the series is called Salt Assault. We're starting with salt. Then we're going to get to the assault portion. Um, but for right now, we need to understand salt a little bit more, understand who we are a little bit more before we get to the assault section. So last week, we talked about preservation and talked about two different aspects of preservation that salt just naturally has and the reasons why salt is used for preservation in life. Number one, it kills microbes. Do you remember that? It kills microbes. And I made the, made the um, allusion to microbes being like sin. sin if, if you ingest microbes into your body through consumption, then it begins to poison you. It makes you sick. In the same way, sin does the same kind of a thing. You know, as I begin to ingest and make these choices uh, to sin, then it begins to poison me. But being salty, salt has this really cool property that it's caused, uh, it, it's, we call it uh, water pressure. Um, Oz, what is it, Osmolic? We're not, thank you, yeah. Thank, I'm telling you, not science. I was a math guy. But basically the principle is that in a cell, you have to have the same amount of pressure on the outside and on the inside or else the cell could rupture. And whenever you get an assault solution, it changes the, uh, the pressure on one side. And so therefore it can cause that molecule to rupture. This is what being salty can do for us. It kills those microbes. In the same way, we, the, the corruption from sin can be eradicated or ruptured in our lives when we are salty like Jesus. This is a very good thing because what it does is it you're talking about how salt preserves. Making right choices against sin to be salty preserves our lives. Amen? And we talked about when I sow to the flesh, I reap corruption. But when I sow to the spirit, I reap life, eternal life, in fact. And so these are choices that you and I get to make that I have to, Jesus says it can lose its saltiness. I, that, I have to understand that this comes back to my choices. Right? It's not just that I give my life to Christ and boom, automatically everything is hunky dory. There is a process that I'm walking out now that I have to choose. Fortunately, I have the mind of Christ and His Holy Spirit to empower me to do so, but I have to now choose whether I'm going to walk salty or not. And when I say I'm walking salty, I'm not talking about salty. Because some Christians make that choice too. <laughs> Talk about a poor reflection of our Father. Walk salty, not crusty. There we go. I hate that word. Mm -hmm. But because of Jesus, we no longer have to live a life that is corrupted. We just have to choose. And, And it's this principle of sowing and reaping. And so if you don't like what you're seeing, check where you're seeding. Remember that? If you don't like what you're seeing in your own life, check where you're seeding. Where are you sowing your seeds? Are you sowing it to your flesh or are you sowing it to the Spirit? The other thing that we talked about last week was how Salt kills microbes, but also how uh, salt dries out food. This is why, one of the reasons it is used for preservation and how it preserves food. And the, re- the reason of the way that it dries out food, food is that it draws out the water from that food. And in the same way, let's talk about us in our lives as Christians, in the same way, as we are gathered together as salty people, the Jesus in me and the salt in me should draw out the living water in you. And this is one of the reasons why, for our own preservation as a body of Christ, we need to be together. 
We need to forsake not, as Hebrews says, forsake not the gathering of the saints. Don't, don't abandon getting, that's what that means. Don't abandon, don't forsake it, don't leave it behind. Listen, I understand if you've got a week that you need to be home. You've got bad weather. I understand what I'm talking about is when I get to the place where I think that it's okay for me to never come to church and to never connect with the body of Christ, that's where I have begun to forsake or abandon gathering together with people, Okay. It's, a different, it's different from taking a momentary vacation, right? Because that happens too. In fact, I'm going to be gone on vacation in a little bit. It's not the same. But abandoning is making this mindset or making this choice of saying, I'm not, I don't need that anymore. I'm good. I'm okay. You begin to buy into lies that, wait a minute, I don't need the body of Christ. When the reality is, as salt, we need one another to draw out the living water within each other. Because God puts things in each and every one of us for other people. And I might miss something that God has for me if I'm not around another person to draw that out. And even worse, if I'm not around another person, that means that they might miss something that God has for them that he's put within me. And if I'm afraid or if I'm complacent or if I'm just good with my own life, then I might miss it for someone else. That puts a whole different perspective on it. But salt draws out water. It draws out the living water of Jesus within us. So the final thing that we talked about last week, I posed the question. I said, could it be that as Christians who are salt, one of our purposes in this life is to prevent decay and decomposition? Because that's what preservation does. Preservation prevents decay and decomposition. Could it be that that is one of the reasons for us as Christians to be salt and light in this earth? And I can back that up by saying that the kingdom of God. Uh oh, there we go. The kingdom of God only knows increase, it does not know decay, it does not know uh, decomposition because it is filled with salt. Salt preserves, and we are to be salt. So don't lose your saltiness. Amen? Okay, you ready for today? I'm going to take a, take a drink real quick, and then we're going to get this thing going. I was excited about today's sermon, actually, as I was reading more about salt, because this is the one, um, today the purpose of salt that we're talking about is, is seasoning. And this is the one that we're probably most familiar with, is seasoning, you know, as we're cooking, or we go to McDonald's and it's loaded with sodium. <laughs> But talking about salt, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about cooking, and I've been trying to cook a little bit more to, to be a little healthier, and, you know, a couple, was, not last week, but the week before, I decided I'm going to cook something. And I'm going to cook some beef shaved steak, you know, make myself some, some nice beef shaved steak, and I'm going to season it. It's going to be delicious. I'm going to use some onions and some green peppers. Well, I didn't have onions or green peppers, so that didn't work out, but... I had, uh, <laughs> I, had, I had chipotle peppers, like in, in uh, what is it, um, not adobe sauce, but uh, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, but anyway, see, I'm not, uh, you know, I know how to order food, okay, <laughs> clearly. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I make this decision, I'm going to try to do this, and I'm going to cook and all that, all right? So I get it, and I'm, I'm seasoning this food, and I'm like, man, that looks so good. It smells amazing. Marley was next to the kale. That smells so good. And I get it all, and I cook it up, and it's good to go. And, you know, the, the recipe called for um, uh, onion powder and garlic powder to season the meat. And I'm like, oh, this is so good. And a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And so I get it all cooked up, go to eat it. And I'm like, this is salty. <laughs> And I realized that instead of garlic powder, I used garlic salt. <laughs> and I tried everything that I could to get that salt out of there. Every trick in the book, you know, I put a bunch of lemon juice on it to try to counteract the salt. I tried washing the whole thing off, like just rinsing it off. I was like, this is awful, but man, it was in there. <laughs> and, and so much to the point where I was like, man, we could, we could probably just leave this out and it would be okay because it's so salty. <laughs> I just would never want to eat it again, you know. And so anyway, I, I threw it away and ate a salad. And <laughs> it was a sad day. But I'll tell you, the very next week, I cooked it again. And I used the right amount this time. I actually used garlic powder, not garlic salt. And it was way better. It was way better. It was very flavorful, and it tasted great. And I had a little bit of salt in there, and it helped to enhance the flavoring and everything. And so, But I thought, man, uh, it was terrible. This is, this is why Kayla doesn't cook that much. But this time I did have green peppers and onions, and it was, it was nice. But 
I thought, man, why, why does salt taste so good? Except when you get way too much. Aside from that, why does salt taste so good? And, and I like salty things. I love French fries. I love potato chips. I, I mean, my last name is Lay. We basically own the potato chip business, okay? Uh, <laughs> I wish. That would be nice. Um, but, but I began to ask, it's like, why does, salt, why does salt taste so good? Salty pretzels, like, you know, you get something that's, have you ever had a French fry and it's unsalted? And it's so disappointing because you're like, oh, I just want that, I want that salt. I, guess I like to take my French fries and dip it in, in, in ice cream. <laughs> and you get, you get that salty sweet, you know? It's just so, it's so good. So why does salt taste so good, though? Why does salt taste so good? I began to study this and look, look into it. And this is, again, this is one of those things where I was like, man, I, I don't know that much about salt. I just know that I like it and I use it. And so why does salt taste so good? And one of the things that I found is salt tastes so good to us because our bodies need it. It's something that our bodies actually need to survive. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I began to read a little bit more, and I wanted to share a few things with you that I found that I thought were very interesting about the properties of salt and why it is the way that it is. And so uh, basically, thanks to salt's chemical nature, it has the ability to intensify agreeable tastes and diminish the not as palatable ones. It has this ability to, to, to basically to, to bring out or to draw out the things that are good and to cover up or to hide the things that are not. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Because see, I'm, I'm reading this through the context of the perception of being a Christian and being a believer and being salt. And I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. This is really, really interesting. So see if you can grab a hold of some of these things today. And we're going to talk about some of it as well. But salt, basically, it allows your taste receptors to pick up on flavors that you normally wouldn't detect. I'll say that again. Salt allows your taste receptors to pick up on things that you wouldn't normally detect. Think about that from a spiritual perspective. Hmm. So things like when you, when you go and you add salt to like a, a roasted squash or something. I don't know how to roast squash, but we'll just use that as an example. A roasted ice cream cup, you know, whatever. <laughs> If you, if you add salt to that kind of a thing, it, what it does is it enhances the flavor. It brings out a myriad of flavors to the foreground that maybe you wouldn't be able to detect had you just had it unsalted. Uh, you can ask Miriam. She used to own a bakery. She would add salt to dough, I'm sure, as she was baking because it would help to make bread taste like bread, make it taste good. When we add salt to things, especially in the cooking process, it begins to bring out and add flavors. Now, the later on in the process it is, the more dominant that salt flavor is going to be. But as you begin to add it in as you're cooking, it does something to the food that allows the good, pleasant flavors to come out. And it doesn't just taste like salt. Like if I were to salt, say we're roasting squash or making bread, if I were to salt that stuff at the beginning as I'm cooking it, when I eat it later, it's not that I'm tasting something that's incredibly salty as if I just poured a bunch of salt on it like I did with, with my beef shaved steak. What it does though is it allows and it enhances flavors to come out that I may not have been able to detect had it not been salted at all. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, this is very, very interesting as a Christian about how salt, salt, it enhances flavors and it enhances sweetness and it blocks out bitterness. I thought, hmm. And in addition to being a general flavor amplifier, salt has a special ability to enhance sweetness in foods. If you were to taste two chocolate puddings that are the same in every way, except that one contains a bit of salt and the other none, the one with salt, ironically, would taste sweeter. Interesting, isn't it? Because you would think that salt is not sweet. It is salty. But when you add salt to something sweet, it makes the sweet taste even sweeter. Maybe that's one of the reasons they like french fries and ice cream. It makes the ice cream taste even sweeter. Come on now. Anyone else's stomach just growl? <laughs> The reason for this is because sodium ions zero in on bitter flavor compounds and suppress them, which makes the sweet flavor seem stronger. The thing that I have been have, am finding more and more is that the reason why this happens is because it's not that it just enhances the sweet, it's that it finds what was bitter, what our brains can identify, our bodies can identify as not a palatable taste, and it will suppress those things and put them in the background while bringing the sweet to the foreground. Right? Right? So, 
I have several things that I want to talk through in Scripture from a spiritual perspective this morning about how this exact kind of a thing, when, when, when our lives are seasoned with salt, what that looks like, how we can be seasoned with salt. Um, and, and the first thing, as I, was, as I was reading all about this, the first thought that came to my mind was, was a scripture about your, your words being seasoned with salt. So I'll, I want to read that this morning to us because our words, we talked about, I think last week or maybe the first week, how powerful our words are. Our speech, the things that we say, that there is life and death in the tongue and it has the power to bring heaven or hell to someone's life. It is that powerful. So we have to understand and learn how to tame it, how to bridle it, how to speak words of life, how to help not hurt, how to not bring destruction and reap destruction on people in their lives. So in Colossians chapter 4, if you would turn with me this morning, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version today. Colossians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 6. Again, this is Paul encouraging the church. So I'm going to encourage you today, the church, amen, in this way. Let his words encourage you this morning. It says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We're just going to stop there. You know, salt, one of the things uh, about salt is it helps to make bitter foods more palatable. And it's why it is a good idea to pair something salty with something bitter. If you were just putting cuisine together, when you pair something salty with something bitter, it helps to make the bitter not as bitter. You throw some salt on some asparagus. Sometimes, you know, asparagus can be kind of bitter. But if you throw some salt on it, it helps to make it not as bitter. So I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about that in the context of our speech. Let your speech be gracious so that you, can, you know how to answer. Let it be seasoned with salt so that you can know how to answer whatever, whether it's another Christian, whether it's a question, whether it's an accusation, whether it's whatever it may be. But let your, let your speech be seasoned with salt. This is something that it's very easy for us to kind of gloss over and think, oh yeah, let my speech be seasoned with salt, let it be gracious, da 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 But if you were to actually stop and meditate on this for a moment, think about how much your speech has an effect on everything that you do and the people that you're around. Right? Our points of contact with people are typically through our speech. Whether it's in a conversation that we're having, whether it's in an email that we typed up or a social media post that we have, we communicate via conversation, right? There's also, you know, uh, body language and all those kinds of things, nonverbal communications. But the majority of the way that we communicate with people is through our speech. So this kind of a thing is it's not necessarily something that I would say, let's put that on the back burner. I think we need to focus on this a little bit, on our speech. If our speech is seasoned with salt, what that will allow us to do is to be around things that are bitter and bring out the good. This is something that Christ was incredibly good at. That even though there may be, you know, Scripture says that he was a friend of sinners, right? So there's a bunch of wrong and a bunch of stuff that's going on that is unrighteous and doesn't look good, and and they're around Jesus. Yet, there's something different about Jesus that makes them want to be like him, makes them want to be around him. When you pair something salty with something bitter, it makes things better. We go from bitter to better. So imagine, if you will, if I'm a salty person in Christ, then when you are around me, the bitterness should begin to fade away. If my speech is seasoned with salt, now if my speech is not seasoned with salt, which is the case sometimes, we... we, have our own attitudes. We have our own thoughts about things. We partner with wrong spirits. And sometimes our speech is not seasoned with salt. It's seasoned with garlic salt. No, it's seasoned with other things that does not help with the bitterness. And therefore, that bitterness just becomes more and more bitter. You can examine in your own life what your speech looks like. And you can examine how people around you are what the reactions are like, what their countenance is like. Those are good examples or good ways to to see, is my speech salty? 
Is it filled with grace? And in fact, in Ephesians, let's, let's go there real quick. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to I share with you this morning, if you don't know how to be seasoned with salt in your speech, this is how. This is one of the ways that we can do this. Um, I love scripture. It gives us great instruction, great teaching. It's, there's really nothing new under the sun. And I can say, hey, let your, let your speech be seasoned with salt. Let it be good speech. And you think, yeah, okay, great. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean to allow my speech to be seasoned with salt and grace? Let's read this. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 25. This is what your speech should be like. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. This is great instruction for you and I. You can ask yourself, is this what my speech is like? Is the corrupting talk that comes out of my mouth? And when we talk about corrupting talk, we're not just talking about... um, cuss words or, or, or dirty jokes or I'm talking corrupting talk can, can be anything that is sinful. It can be anything that is not loving. We think that, that love builds up, right? Our faith should build up. Our hope should build up. Our joy should build up, people, not tear them down. So when you corrupt something, you are destroying it. You are tearing it down. You are, in, you are inviting decay and decomposition into that relationship or into your speech. And that can easily be done as uh, just a gossiping word. You know what I heard? You know what I heard? That can be corrupting kind of talk. I want to read this again, but I want to read it in the Passion Translation because I just love the way that this reads. Uh, and it helps, hopefully, to help understand and soak in a little bit more, like, like salt soaking into some food as you're cooking it. It says, So discard every form of dishonesty and lying, so that you will be known as one who always speaks the truth. For we all belong to one another. Don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge, not even for a day. Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. If any one of you has stolen from someone else, never do it again. Instead, be industrious earning an honest living, and then you'll have enough to bless those in need. And never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth, but instead let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. You know, bless you. Um, It's interesting. One of the things that I'm learning more and more and becoming more aware of, you know, I I wish that I said that every word that came out of my mouth was a word that was salty and grace-filled. I wish that were the case. And and thank God by His Holy Spirit, that is changing. But I believe that as we behold Him more, things in our lives begin to change. As we seek His face more, as we get in His presence more, as we set ourselves intentionally to follow after Him, He begins to change things inside of us. And part of that change is an awakening, a recognition of, hey, wait, an arresting of, wait, that, that, I, I wanted to say this, but I didn't. I wanted, and I think that's part of what scripture tells us in bridling the tongue, you know, is that we have this choice of saying, I, want, I could, I could, man, I could spout it off with the best of them and I could, I could cut you down or I could share this piece. Of, here's the biggest thing. I could share this piece of information with you that I have that is truth that would harm someone else. I could do that, but I'm choosing not to. I'm choosing to bridle my tongue. I'm choosing to cover in love. Because see, that's what love does. It covers a multitude of sins. You know what so-and-so did? They cheated on their wife and they did this, this, that. Okay, that may all be true, but that doesn't mean that you have to go and spout it off to everybody. Not Everybody doesn't have to have all of the information in all of the world. This is important for us to understand and to keep. Am I covering, and this is the, these are the questions that you can ask in your own mind. Am I covering my brother? Am I covering my sister in love? Lay aside bitter words and and temper tantrums and 
revenge and profanity and insults and those kinds of things. Lay, lay those things aside. You might have every right to come back and to say this. You might have the best comebacks in all of the world. A lot of times what ends up happening, and the reason that we do these things, it's very interesting. I'm doing a study on this. We do it out of self-preservation. And we do it to endear others to ourselves. I want to tell you something juicy so that I can endear you to me. Because I think that in the end, it's going to help me to preserve me. But love is not about self-preservation. Right? The gospel of Jesus Christ is about us laying down our lives. Right? And picking up love, putting on love. So in that, I may have every right to share with you whatever I want to share with you because it's information that I have. And if I can share it with you, then it can endear you to me so that I can be safe and be preserved. But all self-preservation is, is done out of fear. And if perfect love casts out fear, then I don't have to preserve myself. He is my preserver. As I become more and more like him, I become salty and Salt's attributes are preservation. That wasn't even in my notes. That was for free this morning. (laughs) So put away bitter words and temper tantrums and those kinds of things. And instead, don't don't be like that. (laughs) But be kind. Be affectionate towards one another. Let your speech be filled with grace. And I mean, think about it. Has God not forgiven you? Has God graciously forgiven you? Do you realize that God has graciously forgiven you? So then, therefore, graciously, out of the depths of Christ's love for others, forgive and release others. Let them be. Cover them in love. From the depths of Christ's love. It is from this love that we speak to others. From Christ's love, we speak to others because his love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You and I are empowered to walk this way in love. This is why love is so important. Man, it touches every aspect of our lives. And it's not just saying nice things. Here's the difference. Reaching others with Christ's love and and having your, your, your speech filled with grace is not just reaching others by saying nice and good things because it's the nice and good thing to do. It is saying nice, good, kind, affectionate things because it is from the very depths of my own being because I am now like Christ. I am in Christ. We are inseparable. And it is because his nature is within me. It's not just because, oh, I know it's the right thing to do. You know what? Sometimes we have to make that choice because inside we aren't feeling it. I want to say every kind of a thing. But We need to get to this place, and we will as we continue to behold his face and become intimate with him and cultivate a relationship with him that it is no longer, it's no longer about me even making a choice. It's just who I am now because it is Christ in me, this life that I no longer live. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. The life that I live now is not by myself. It's not by me. It's not by my flesh. It's not by how I feel. It's not by my emotions. It is by his spirit. He has changed me from the inside out. So it's not just about, oh, well, somebody told me to say the right things, and so I'm just being obedient. Yeah, obedience is good, but obedience from a place of love and character change is better. I can be begrudgingly obedient, but God always looks at the heart. Always. I don't want to serve him with my mouth and my heart be far from him. And you know, it's funny, Jesus, okay, Jesus actually talked about this. In Matthew, he, they, they, he talked about, because uh, the Pharisees got all up on him because he fed his disciples with dirty hands. They didn't wash their hands before they ate. And so Jesus goes, hey, listen, it's not about what you put in your body that defiles you. It's about what comes out of your body. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So Make sure that the heart is filled with good things so that it is not defiled, it is not corrupted, it's salty. Let salty speech come from your mouth. Okay, you're getting a lot of free ones today. (laughs) Allow the salt of your life to be a sweetness enhancer and a bitterness reducer. How about that? Okay, so continuing on in salt, I'm going to grab a drink real quick. 
We'll say law on that. I have a few more things that I want to touch on this morning because I think this is important for us. Speech is one. We talked about speech. Number two, if you're taking notes, salt enhances giftings with encouragement. Being salty enhances giftings with encouragement through encouragement. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I'm thinking about how, how salt enhances natural flavors that are within whatever it may be, right? If salt enhances those natural flavors, what, if, what does it look like if you and I, being salty people, get around other people, we begin to encourage and exhort one another in the gifts, now all of a sudden the natural things that God has placed within them begin to come out more and more and more. It begins to enhance that flavor. Last week we talked about it in drawing out the living water. Okay, now let's talk about it in enhancing the flavor, the goodness The gifts of God are good. He gives good gifts to his children. The gifts of his Holy Spirit are good things. So as salt, should we, when we are around people, should we enhance the flavor of what God has put within each and every one of them? Because some, it might look one way. Some might have a real meaty flavor, and some might have, uh, not olives, because olives don't taste good, but um, (laughs) a real cheesy flavor. How's that? That'd be me. I'm cheesy. I got cornball written all over me. But could salty people or Christians be used to help identify and enhance the gifts and flavors that God has put in each person? You know, Scripture talks about encouraging others to good works, and in fact, that's what we talked about with Hebrews. Don't neglect the gathering together, but instead pursue one another, uh, encourage one another, stir each other up onto good works, provoke each other to good works. Hey, what are you doing? Why are you sitting around? Why are you just sitting in a pew? Don't just be a consumer. Come on, get out. Use that thing. Let's go. You're not doing any good sitting on the shelf. There are people that need salt. Get out there. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. 1 Peter 4. I want to read that this morning. This is so good. And it goes right along with this. Above all, keeping love, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 Don't, don't, Don't think that I can just have these gifts and be okay with just having these gifts. Like Sister Beverly was saying, this isn't about you coming to just get a word, you to be built up. Yes, that's an aspect of it, but it doesn't stop there. It is so that, so that, so that, like so that. Man, that was good. (laughs) I'm telling you guys, he's trying to tell us something this morning. So that you got to sow it, you got to use it, and maybe as salty people, that's part of our job and responsibility is to get around other salty people to help to draw those things out so that they can see God has given me some very natural and wonderful flavors, some giftings that are used to not be bitter but to be sweet, a sweet smelling aroma, a sweet tasting goodness, so that people can see how good our God is. Because it is, it is his goodness that leads us to repentance. It is the goodness of God that leads people to change. And if they can see his goodness represented in his people, in his body, because they're salty and they're drawing those things out, then the world can do nothing but change. Because where we go, it's sweet. I'm going to start saying that. Where I go, it's sweet. It's sweet where I go, because I'm salty. 1 Thessalonians 5, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Keep building up. Keep drawing out those flavors. All right, so that was one of them I want to talk about. The second thing, or the third thing, what salt does with seasoning is that it breaks down walls and it brings life. This is so applicable in our speech. That salt, from a, from a, from a, a chemical perspective, it breaks down cell walls, right? We talked about how it can rupture the, the, the microbe walls but it breaks down walls. In the same way, our salty speech helps to break down walls in the lives of people around us. We all put up walls in our lives from time to time. Why do we put up walls? Self-preservation. 
We put up walls to preserve ourselves because we're afraid of intimacy. We're afraid that someone will know who we really are. We're afraid that darkness will be brought to light. Insert your own excuse there. But the reality is we put up these walls to protect ourselves. Self-preservation. What salt does is it actually comes in and it breaks down those walls. When I was a kid, my mom used to share with me a lot that a soft answer turns away wrath. A gentle response turns away wrath. A salty response turns away bitterness. It turns away wrath. It turns away anger. Could it be that if, if we are walking and living saltily, that as we're encountering people who maybe oppose us, I wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? As I encounter someone who opposes me, that the salt in my own life because of the power of God and the Holy Spirit at work within me, can then go to work and begin to break down those walls so now, now me, as flesh and blood, can reach them as flesh and blood. So that they know that there is a God that loves them. They know that there is righteousness and peace and joy available to them in the kingdom of God. That these walls and these barriers are broken down because of the power of our God working behind the scenes through our speech, through our actions, to break down walls in people's lives so that they can receive and see the goodness of God. The power of salt, guys. The power of a seasoned, salty life. You know, when you get around someone and they say, man, there's just something about you. It's different. Sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. Sometimes it's like, wow, it's like I want to be like that. But then sometimes... People get like angry, and you're like, why is that? Because there's a spiritual thing going on here that's stirring something up that they've partnered with a principality, a power, a spirit of darkness, and that is opposing the light in us. So maybe as salty people, we are sent then, you know, one of my favorite scriptures lately has been in Isaiah about, it was talking about Jesus, and it was that he had been given the tongue of the learned so that I may sustain the weary with a word. And that's been my prayer for myself, is that, that God, give me the tongue of the learned so that through my words and through my speech, through teaching and through my life, I can sustain with a word. Gracious speech that breaks down walls and opens up hearts so that we can connect with the gospel of Jesus Christ that is life-giving and life-producing and fruit-producing. Lord, help me to be gracious in my speech and to be humble enough to lay my own life down, my own feelings, my own emotions down. When I could rise up and stand up and be completely justified in the things that I say and attack, help me to lay those things down, to receive your love and to cover in love those who are around me, those who offend, those who hurt. Help me to cover. Help me to not live in self-preservation, but to live in your love. And help me to be salty to those around me, that they can see your goodness, because this is about how good you are, how wonderful you are, and how you can change us from the inside, that we don't have to live with walls. We don't have to live with hurts. We don't have to live with bitterness, whether it came from someone on the street or someone in the pulpit, that we can walk in forgiveness, that we can stand in love, and that we can be salty in our speech as we encounter any and everyone around us. Salt breaks down walls. And being seasoned salt can be disarming. And here's the really cool thing about salt. Salt brings life to places of death and sickness. And I want to give you an example of this. Elisha, let's just read it. We'll read it. In 2 Kings chapter 2, it says, Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of the city is pleasant, but as my Lord sees, the water is bad. The water is bad. Y'all know it's a bad thing when your water is bad because we kind of need it to live. And if a city doesn't have water, it's got to find some other source to bring that water in. If their water supplies are bad, life is going downhill. Okay? Understand the situation. The water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Elisha says, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. Hmm. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
bring me a new bowl and put some salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and he threw the salt in the water. He threw the salt in the place where the death and the sickness was. He didn't hide the salt away and tell the salt to pray about it. He took the salt and he put it right in the middle of all the nasty going on. Because salt overcomes. God, this is so good. I love it. I told you, man, I got excited about all this. Like, God is so good. Then he went to the spring and he threw the salt in and he said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. Whoo! So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. Here's the really cool thing about all of this. It is by the power of God that people are healed. Not the power of salt. Salt is the vehicle. Send me, I'll go. God, put me in the middle of the garbage. Let me be a light for you so that you can heal, so that you can restore, so that you can bring life. There was miscarriage. There was death. There was no reproduction. You couldn't have a baby. What happens when a society cannot have babies? They die out. They decay. They decompose. Not in the kingdom of God. We are salt and light. Be salt in a dead, fruitless place and allow God to bring healing and restoration to the communities around us. You know, there's people that want to say America is going to hell in a handbasket. Look how awful this is. Look at the political situation. Guess what? This is our opportunity to be salt in the world. Hey, we should rejoice at that. Let us speak truth in love. Let us be a light that cannot be hidden by darkness. Let us be salt that is flavored and passionate and filled with the Holy Spirit. And let our speech be gracious towards those we encounter. We are not wrestling against people. We are loving people. And we are standing firm in who we are as salt and light. We are not being uh, impacted by other doctrines and other philosophies and other things because we are so focused. It's you and me, Jesus. It's you and me. I behold your face. No one else's. I behold your face. I refocus. I come back to this place of refocus with blinders on my eyes that whether the right or to the left, whatever's going on, it does not matter to me. It does not matter if my house is on fire, I'm focused on you because you are my preservation. You keep me, you hold me, you set my foot upon a rock, you establish my goings. You have good things, a hope and a future for me. And of your kingdom, there is no end. Of your peace, there is no end. So I'm gonna stand in your peace today. It was by the power of God that the water was healed through the spreading of salt. God wants to use you to bring his healing and life to cities of people experiencing death and sickness. He wants to use you. This is where we transition from, being, from salt to assault. Setting this up for next week. Are you ready? All right, the best part about being salty. This is the final thing I'm going to close on this this morning. The best part about being salty. Excuse me. I need some water. Too much salt. <laughs> the best part of being salty. Have you ever eaten something really salty or had a big old thing of french fries? What's the next thing that you do? You tend to reach for something to drink, right? Because it's so salty. It draws out that water. When we are salty and when we are in the world and people get a taste of who we are as salty people, it makes them thirsty. And Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, hey, Give me a drink. And he goes on to say, people who drink of this water, they'll thirst again. People who chase after things that they think will satisfy their thirst in this world and in this life, they will thirst again. I promise you they will thirst again. You try to fulfill yourself with a person, you try to fulfill yourself with a job, you start to chase other things, you will be thirsty again. But if you drink from the living water, you will never thirst again. So part of our deal, attributes as salty people, is that when we get around things that are unsalty, 
it makes them thirsty. And it gives us opportunity to show them Jesus. Because the salt has made them thirsty. The salt has broken down the walls. The salt is littered in grace and in truth. So now we pave the way for Jesus to come in and heal, restore, and make salty. The best part. This is not about our lives, guys. This is not about us. This has always been about him. The focus is always back on Jesus. You know, Paul writes, and I want to read this final thing to conclude. In Acts chapter 20, he says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. My life means nothing to me. It's not valuable. This isn't about me. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. My life means nothing to me. But let it be something that testifies to the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we as salty people would not take up our lives and think, oh, I'm salty. I'm all that. And a bag of chips, Lay's, really salty ones. <laughs> but may we lay down our lives, may we pick up the salty and walk forward so that our lives are testimonies and that they would testify to the goodness and the glory of our God, our Father, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. His gospel, his gospel alone. Not the gospel according to Caleb, not the gospel according to anyone or anything else, but the gospel according to Jesus Christ. King of kings, Lord of lords, salt master. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Stand with me. Let's be finished this morning. I think that's enough. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I hope you're charged today. I hope you're charged today. We had a great time of worship. Man, I'm receiving stuff even as I'm up here teaching. I'm thinking, Lord, whew. my prayer is that we are all changed and transformed and continue to change and transform into his image and in his likeness. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. <laughs> you are a good God and a good Father. You are the source of life. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, and we just put our trust in you today. If there's anyone who is in here or if there's anyone who has been watching who has never given their life or put in their faith in Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to say yes to Jesus. It's very simple. You just say yes to him. You acknowledge that he is God, that Jesus came to this earth and that he died for you and that he rose again that he is fully God, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that when you say yes, you're saying yes to giving your life to him. You're saying yes to teach me, God, how to be like you. Teach me how to walk in your ways. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. He says if you ask, it'll happen. So if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit of God today, just ask. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be empowered to walk out this life today and tomorrow and for the rest of my life. And I want to be a representation of who you are. Change me every single day. That's a prayer for all of us. Let us be continually changed and transformed into your image and in your likeness, God. Let us look like Jesus. Let our, 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 our speech be filled with grace and truth and love. If there is bitterness within our hearts, Father, throw some salt on it, Holy Spirit. May we release those things as we sang prophetically this morning. I'm letting go of it today. It is your anointing that breaks the yoke. So if we are partnered with anything and yoked to anything other than Jesus, may your anointing break those things. May we say yes to you today and partner with you because your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. Help us walk in the easy with you. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the, the work that you're doing in this place. I thank you for the work that you're doing in your people and in your body. Help us every day to stay focused on you. We repent for anything that is not of you. And we refocus ourselves today. Help us to be salt and light in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.